Uh, I'm David Lowry. I'm the speaker this evening, and I'm a neurosurgeon here in Holland. I serve also as medical director for neurosurgery here at the hospital. This is a bit about my background. I went to Hope for my undergraduate work, then Johns Hopkins for medical school, and then I did both my MBA and a neurosurgery residency at the University of Pittsburgh, which is one of the top five academic publishing uh, departments. That isn't the direction I took my career. I like taking care of patients, and I wanted to live near family and friends. Uh, so I came back to West Michigan and have practiced here initially in Grand Rapids and then since 2005 here in Holland. I would have come to Holland first if I thought it was big enough to support a neurosurgeon, actually. I assumed it wasn't um, and eventually migrated this way. Um, I've done a little bit of publishing, uh, but uh, uh, have also spent some time in uh, medical device development. So we'll talk about leading edge spine care tonight, and we'll start by just discussing a bit about what can cause problems. So what causes back or neck pain or other symptoms arising from spinal pathology. There's a lot in the spine. Uh, there are the vertebral bodies, the bones themselves, the discs, which are the cartilage pads between the vertebral bodies. There are joints at the back of the spine, one on the right, one on the left, called facet joints. Uh, in the neck, we also have something called an uncovertebral complex, or another sort of joint in the front. We have ligaments, nerve roots, the spinal cord, of course, arteries, uh, including arteries that supply the brain stem in the neck. Uh, and then uh, muscle and fascia, and fascia being a fibrous tissue that overlies the muscle. So what can possibly go wrong with any complicated piece of machinery? As it turns out, quite a bit. And this is a partial list. Uh, vertebral bodies can fracture or can develop a tumor. Discs can degenerate over time slowly or can herniate or rupture somewhat abruptly. Facet joints can develop fluid collections within them that can cause pain either within the joint or surrounding nerve roots that can get pinched. And we can also develop a slippage in the spine if facet joints have severe arthritis within them. Uh, the uncovertebral complex or uncovertebral joints in the front can enlarge and degenerate over time and can press on the nerve root or the spinal cord. Ligaments can tear, nerve roots can become can pinched, the spinal cord, of course, can develop a tumor within it or outside of it um, and can develop a fluid collection within it. And there are a number of other things, of course, that can happen to the spinal cord uh, that may have nothing to do with surgery. Um, arteries can develop dissections, uh, a tear within the blood vessel. Um, there can also be abnormal vascular malformations, as they're known, involving arteries that affect the spine. Muscles can have spasms or strain. Etc. So there's a lot that can happen, and of course this is just a partial list. And that's even when we're thinking about the individual components of the spine. If we think about the spine as a whole, its alignment is very important. And uh, we've learned a lot about this over the last 10 to 15 years. If you think about the diagram to the left, uh, and I think there's a laser on here somewhere. I'm terrified to, oh, here we go, maybe this, uh, yeah, there we go. If you look at the, uh, di the diagram on the left here and consider the green plane, that's, of course, the perspective in which this image uh, is situated. The spine will normally have a forward bowing curve in the neck, a backward bowing curve in the mid-back or thoracic region, and then a forward bowing curve in the lower back. If the alignment isn't correct, people are at a higher risk of developing significant pain, and that can occur depending upon which region of the spine is affected, anywhere from the back of the head down to the tailbone area. So the alignment of the spine as a whole is very important as well. With time, that alignment can change, and the spine changes to accommodate that, or it doesn't. And people can experience neck pain or back pain uh, or other symptoms that we'll discuss in a minute related to those changes in alignment. When we think about the neck or the cervical spine, uh, 
we're not thinking only about neck pain because when people have spinal problems affecting the neck, they can have pain or numbness or tingling or weakness or a combination of those things affecting the shoulder, arm, hand, or fingers. People can also develop a decline in balance or declining coordination in the hands. Uh, I've had many patients who assume they have carpal tunnel syndrome on one or both sides and um, you find that, in fact, it's uh, more than that. In the lumbar spine or the low back, we think about pain uh, or numbness or tingling or weakness uh, affecting the hip, buttock, and legs. When we're trying to figure out what to do about these problems, we'll often rely on x-rays, MRI, or CT scan, and we learn different things from each. On an x-ray, we get one shot. In this case, it's showing a side view or lateral view of the cervical spine, the neck. We get one shot of the bone as a whole. And so we'll see all of the bone within the spine. Uh, there are some uh, questions that we want to answer for which these are very helpful, including alignment. It's easy to get x-rays when a person is standing up or if we're having them bend forward, backward, side to side. What we don't get, though, is detail about the nervous system necessarily, and that we will see with greater clarity on an MRI. This is an MRI also of the neck. We see greater detail in bone when we look at a CT scan. We see bone on an x-ray, but we see all of it at once. We see much greater detail in the bone and can look at sections selectively with a CT scan in a way that we can't with plain x-rays. And so that's why we'll often need all of these. And there are other things we'll use as well, such as uh, electrodiagnostic studies and EMG and nerve conduction study. Uh, to look for any slowing uh, or a decreased signal affecting a part of the nervous system. Uh, we may also uh, use something called a SPECT scan, which will look at blood flow, which can be helpful for tumor, inflammation, or infection. Uh, so these are studies that we'll all use. This shows a little pathology. So on this MRI here, we see bulging discs which are actually more of a degenerative process and not a disc herniation or disc rupture. The spinal cord is this darker gray structure and the white is spinal fluid or cerebral spinal fluid. This section has some narrowing and it's even more severe when we look right here on this image. So this, that just demonstrates one uh, way in which an MRI uh, has a lot of utility for us. MRIs and CTs are also helpful not only for what they show but for what they don't show. So even if we get a study and we don't see something that could have explained a person's symptoms, we're still one step closer to understanding the true cause and being able to help. <coughs> so we'll now talk about things that we do, our approach to try to help with uh, spinal pathology. Uh, this is just a shot of the web page of the Holland Hospital uh, Spine home page, if you will. And so if you either Google Holland Hospital Spine or go to hollandhospital.org slash spine, uh, you'll come to this uh, page and um, you can navigate from this, of course. So I just show that to you so you're aware of that as a resource. So we're trying to use an approach here uh, in which we do physical therapy first for most spinal problems. Uh, not every spinal problem, of course, can be solved by rehab alone, but for the vast majority, they can be. Most people don't need to see a physician, actually, uh, for the majority of their treatment. Most people certainly don't need a surgeon. Most people can be very effectively managed by typically a physical therapist, and then a physical therapist will bring in uh, their colleagues in occupational therapy where needed. But physical therapy will typically take the lead on this for us. So why see a therapist? Why not try to just work it out on your own or get a massage or things of that sort? Well, first, if working it out on your own solves the problem, great. You know, if you take a Motrin and the pain goes away and it doesn't come back, you don't need to see anybody, right? I mean, I think we'd all agree with, uh, with that. 
Um, and if a simple massage or something is really takes care of whatever issue you may have in the moment, um, you know, maybe that's not a problem. But if you're having to get a massage every week, <laughs> you know, if you're needing to um, see an uh, other uh, a provider to have uh, some relief of spinal problems on a regular basis, then it's probably reasonable to have a more thoughtful look. Uh, this is uh, just showing one framework from one school uh, within physical therapy that is a, a helpful tool, uh, but a physical therapist who's been trained in spine-focused techniques uh, will be able to do an assessment and classify what kind of problem you're having and then that will allow them to better apply the appropriate treatment uh, and it will also and hopefully as well provide you with a way to avoid having to be in their office again um, and thankfully for the majority of people who have spinal problems uh, a little education and um, a, a patient being educated about what they can do on their own will go a long way toward getting them feeling better. So this approach is one that's uh, undergone a lot of reworking at the hospital and the therapy first approach that uh, is being used now is one that's prompt. The therapy team has realized that it has been hard for people to get appointments now this doesn't mean that somebody can suddenly show up within an hour of placing a call, but it does mean that the templates of the scheduling templates of the physical therapists um, have been organized to be able to get people in uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, it's also personalized. The uh, therapist will uh, look at each patient as an individual because People come in not only with symptoms, but also their own personal goals, and those will differ. Uh, for some person, it may be getting back to heavy landscaping within their, uh, you know, either their work or at their own home. And for someone else, it may be uh, you know, a lot less active. But the therapist will take into account the complaint, the goals of the patient, what they uh, come to find the pathology is likely to be in coming up with the treatment plan. And so you're not having to try to, you know, walk through the dark on your own. You get some help with this. The treatment is also personalized with respect to scheduling. Um, there isn't a one-size-fits-all. It's not as though if you call the therapy uh, team, you'll be scheduled for three times a week, you know, for four to six weeks, you know, right off the bat. For some people, that's indicated. And for others, they may need one appointment and then move on. Um, the therapy... Uh, team also uh, has already and continues to pursue specialized treatment in uh, managing spine problems. Anyone who is qualified in physical therapy has had um, some exposure to, some, uh, to spine. Uh, for some it may be more extensive, for others it may be more limited. And given the prevalence of spinal pathology the hospital therapy team has really made a concerted effort to raise their game with respect to their own uh, knowledge and uh, qualifications in this area. And so when you come in with a spine-related complaint, you'll be paired up with someone who's done additional training in spine. And um, the therapist can certainly discuss that with you uh, at greater length. It's collaborative as well. <clears throat> the therapist can rely on their own colleagues in occupational therapy. If there's a specific task or work-related or recreational-related um, uh, task or activity that you need to have optimized or you need your environment optimized to help you be your best, the occupational therapy team can step in and help with that. Uh, the uh, physical therapist will also collaborate with physicians who have additional training in a discipline called physical medicine and rehabilitation. It's an area of medicine that uh, some people uh, don't know exists, but physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians have done additional training in a four-year uh, post-medical school training program 
that covers areas of neurology and orthopedics uh, and uh, things such as bracing and the whole area of orthotic aids um, and uh, also the medical needs of patients who are going through uh, intensive rehab such as after a bad accident or have had burns or stroke or spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury. So these are physicians who manage the medical needs and um, also work with the, uh, the therapists in handling uh, the therapy needs uh, for patients who uh, have gone through some significant events, but their background is often very helpful for less intensive needs as well. And then finally, occasionally you need a surgeon. <coughs> this just indicates where Holland Hospital Rehab uh, has uh, offices. Uh, the red dots, uh, hopefully they project well, but um, they're, they extend up from uh, north of town down to the Saugatuck Douglas area and of course a number of locations in the area. And you can get to all of this through that same uh, website that I mentioned as well, the Holland Hospital org slash spine uh, website has a link to this. On staff at Holland Hospital and associated with the hospital, we have a number of physicians who can be helpful as well. And often this is the first point of entry into the system. Uh, I would encourage you to discuss any concerns about spinal pathology with your primary physician. Uh, they may elect to refer you to a PM&R physician or physiatrist, as we call it. Uh, that, th these are physicians who are specialized in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, we have two in town, um, uh, Cara, Dr. Uh, Sarah Kane Smart over at Shoreline Orthopedics and uh, Dr. Shelley Freimark at the Brain and Spine Center where I practice. Uh, you may be referred uh, to either a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic spine surgeon. Uh, there's uh, an orthopedic spine surgeon in town, it's Dr. Kostiuk. Uh, he's over at Shoreline, uh, where Dr. Kane Smart practices, and then uh, myself at Brain and Spine, where uh, Dr. Freimark practices. You may also be uh, referred for pain medicine specialists. Uh, they can optimize medication and also offer injections uh, to uh, try to get some pain relief, whether injections of local anesthetics or of uh, uh, steroid medications. And then finally, in extreme situations, uh, emergency medicine physicians are very helpful for spine problems. Although we don't encourage people to start there. Um, you know, obviously that's a resource if there's a sudden need, um, but we encourage people whenever possible to try to get plugged into the system uh, earlier and before there's a crisis so that uh, that can be avoided. Now, my part of this is surgery, and these are images that often come to people's minds if they think of back surgery, something big and awful and ugly. Now, uh, there are times when big incisions such as are depicted here are, in fact, appropriate. Um, and the uh, patient here is one example of a person who required such a procedure. Um, but not everyone, thankfully, needs that. One option that we have available to us when surgery is needed is uh, called percutaneous fusion. And this is a procedure in which we place screws, uh, now with robotic guidance, and I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, we place the screws with precision using little poke holes through the t skin and the underlying tissue. And then we can thread a, a rod as shown here the rod is connected to the inserter. The rod gets inserted and then the inserter is removed. Uh, we can place that through the screws. The screws are deep to the surface, of course, but we can locate where the screws are located. Or, or we can locate where each screw is positioned uh, through the tower, as these are known, that extends out of the skin. After the rod is positioned, we insert a screw that holds the rod onto the the pedicle screw as it's called, and then after we secure the rod in place where it contacts every single one of the screws, those little tabs that are protruding through the skin can be broken off. So what's left is the hardware deep within the body, but we don't actually need to see it to get it in position. We can place it through poke holes. When we don't have to do a fusion on the spine, uh, 
we can uh, also remove something that's pressing upon a nerve root or the spinal cord uh, with less invasive ways. One way of doing this is uh, using what's called a tubular retractor. <clears throat> what we will do is under x-ray guidance place an initial probe through a small opening in the skin. Once we dock it where we want it to be with x-ray, we will then sequentially dilate using progressively larger diameter tubes. We then have a retractor that we place on the outside of the tubes and that retractor can then be affixed to a table base. So the retractor doesn't move if we don't want it to move, or we can let it move if we prefer that for the, the goal that we have in mind in the moment. This tube stays in place, the hollow tube that was fitted over the stack of these dilators, and then all of the dilators are removed. We then have something that looks like this, a little opening. This shows a little light cord, and so light illuminates what's down inside and we can move that or leave it fixed depending upon the need. This allows us to work on the spine without having to do a big exposure through, uh, and my typical retractor is 16 millimeters in diameter. I, on a thinner person with a disc herniation, if there's not a lot of drilling we need to do, uh, we can do it through a 14 millimeter tube. Uh, but a 16 millimeter tube is about three-fifths of an inch, and so it's a rather small opening. And we actually haven't found yet that getting much smaller than that is helpful. You know, nine millimeters versus 16 millimeters, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference when you get down to that scale. Uh, but we can also move the retractor, of course, and sweep it side to side because the overlying skin and fatty tissue have some give to them, and uh, so we can open up the spinal channel from side to side by simply making an opening on one side only, and that's a frequently employed technique. Another option is an endoscope. That gets us down to nine millimeters, uh, and the endoscope is, uh, uh, has some advantages and disadvantages. Um, one advantage is that we're running irrigation uh, throughout the case, and so the tissue doesn't, uh, we don't have to worry about irrigating manually as much, and there's not a worry about the tissue getting in, uh, drying out at all. Um, the endoscope is a little smaller, although right, so thus far we really haven't found much of a difference in recovery, we haven't found difference in recovery between uh, smaller tubular retractors and the endoscope. Uh, one disadvantage is an endoscope is two-dimensional. Uh, you're looking at a screen uh, that's generated from the endoscope, uh, unlike uh, the tubular retractors where we're using an operating microscope where we can use binocular vision. So we have better depth perception with the, the uh, microscope and uh, using both of our eyes than we do with just an endoscope and having a two-dimensional image. But uh, with uh, the advancement of uh, IT, our ability to see three-dimensionally with endoscopes is improving, and so I'm sure that that will, uh, that will continue to evolve. After we remove an offending disc, for instance, if a person has that requirement, um, there, we need to do something to replace or to fill in that space and to repair what we've had to do in order to gain access to the spinal cord or nerve root. Um, in the neck, we will often go from the front because uh, we can avoid going through the muscles of the spine as we have to when we go in from the back. When we go in from the back, there's more muscle pain than when we go in from the front. Additionally, the geometry of how the nerve roots leave the body make it easier to remove bone spurs that are pressing on uh, a nerve root when we come in from the front. Uh, that's generally true, and bone spurs can grow either behind a nerve root or in front of a nerve root. In the neck, as it turns out, most of them come grow from the front, so that's also a more direct way to get access to the pathology. So when we open things up, what we are looking at is 
uh, a section of the spine that looks like this, but the challenge is the pinched nerve and the spinal cord are behind this bone, behind the cartilage. The usual way we approach this is to remove whoops, the cartilage that's in front of the spinal cord and a pinched nerve, and then we can work through that space using the operating microscope to make more room for the nerve root. Uh, but again, after we take the disc out, we need to put something in its place. If we don't, we lose that forward bowing curvature of the neck. If we don't repair that, the neck starts to bend forward, a person starts to hold their head in a more forward position, and that puts more strain on the musculature at the back of the neck. And so we want to achieve a good repair. One way of doing this is uh, by putting in a disc replacement. Another is by doing a fusion, and these are depictions of both. With a fusion, we actually have a little wedge of bone material that's put in place here, uh, and sometimes an additional material to prevent that forward bowing curve, and then we'll often use a plate. There are other devices that sit fully within the disc space uh, and don't uh, reside in front of the spine, uh, and there are uses for either of those. Unfortunately, the artificial disc, um, it's not really for everyone. So someone who has osteoporosis or osteopenia, softer bone, isn't a good candidate for that. And some problems that we address in the spine uh, aren't really, don't, don't lend themselves well to that. Uh, but it does allow a patient to retain movement at that level in the neck uh, when that's an option. This is another minimally invasive approach. Instead of going through the disc though, this technique shows a hole being drilled through the bone. The hole is drilled in an oblique fashion and that gets us to the pathology that's right behind the disc, whether it's a disc rupture or a bone spur. After we make that channel, we can then insert a bone plug and over time the bone plug goes away. Here's a patient I did this procedure on. This is soon after the surgery. You can make out right here the bone plug. And over time, it's hard to spot. There's the outline, but this is the one-year shot. And uh, her own bone had healed and incorporated that. We're also very excited to have um, a spine robot. So Holland Hospital is the only hospital in Michigan at this point that has uh, robotic technology for soft tissue dissection cases, um, the Da Vinci robot. That's used by general surgery and urology, uh, OBGYN, um, and I may be forgetting somebody, but cardiac surgery also uh, is a, a common user of uh, that device. Um, Holland has also the Mako robot for orthopedic surgery and customizing uh, uh, joint replacements. And uh, in spine, we're using the Mazor X uh, robot. This is, uh, it's really exciting technology. And uh, it has a few components. I'll just, just explain this a little bit. So the patient is, of course, uh, usually lying face, face down, of course, on the operating table. And the robot arm is really where the action is. And what happens is this little piece here uh, will be positioned by the robot over the patient in the precise place for positioning a screw that we will insert into the spine. This allows us to be very precise. The benefit of being precise is uh, one, we have a lower risk of injuring any of the facet joints, uh, the joints at the back of the spine when we're putting screws in. We are also able to put in the perfectly sized screw. Uh, it's, if we can't be as precise, it's tempting to undersize a screw just to make sure it's not going to irritate a nerve root. With this technology, though, we can put in the optimal screw, a larger one if needed, uh, every time. Um, and we are also able to better protect the nerve roots and the nerve bundle that we're working beside while we place the instrumentation. So ultimately, the patient who's lying face down will have this arm and specifically this little black cylinder 
positioned exactly where needed for an individual screw. Uh, the robot knows where to go because the robotic arm has an array of fiducials, if this makes sense to anyone, that are detected by this praying mantis looking structure here. Um, we go through a step where we will have a CT scan of the patient's area of interest before the surgery. And then during the surgery, we get x-rays that will, with uh, some reference beads within them, also called fiducials, by matching up the patient's intraoperative x-ray with the CT, we know precisely where every single vertebra of the spine, every bone of the spine is located, and we know where it's located in three-dimensional space within the patient, even though we can't see it. That's what allows the device to be very precise. Um, and, you know, it's recalibrated frequently, and we uh, register the device um, in a custom fashion for every patient. Um, and, of course, the device also has uh, safeguards in place so that if something isn't making sense or if a calculation isn't working, uh, you know, within uh, the computer, um, the device uh, sends us alert messages. This is the screen we work from. So here is a ghost image of this one screw on the left, a ghost image of a screw on the right. And we can rotate them. Uh, we can move the screw freely. Uh, we can move back it out, put it in, whatever. But we can come up with a specific plan level by level. And the importance of a level by level registration is, as you can imagine, the orientation of the spine will change from how a, position, how a patient is positioned on a CT scanner to how the spine is positioned when a patient is face down. The spine moves. And if each individual bone changes in position with respect to the bone next to it, but the device isn't picking up on that, uh, we lose significant precision. This was an advance, the level by level registration. Each bone is considered by itself that was a significant advance in the software uh, making spine robotics uh, practical. And it's also uh, the big reason why Medtronic uh, bought the Mazor uh, company, uh, which was initially based out of Israel. Um, and so this just gives a depiction. So we can look at the spine in this projection. I can look at it from the side and go slice by slice. Am I going to injure a, ner injure a nerve root anywhere? Am I not? I can look at it front to back. And this projection is very helpful because ultimately when I'm going through a strut connecting the front of the spine with the back of the spine, in the mid portion of the spine, it's only a bony circle and I have to make sure I'm threading the needle appropriately or I'll damage that structure or I'll injure a nerve root beside it. And so this gives me a very uh, precise way of doing that. Um, and of course, when we're putting a screw in place, for a patient who has osteoporosis or osteopenia, softer bone, it's very important that we not undersize it. We want to take full advantage of the bone that's available because that will give us a greater surface area to surface area contact between the threads of the screw and the uh, trabeculae of the bone, the little spikes uh, within the spongy bone. This just shows a surgeon uh, using the device so each instrument that we use will be threaded through this very precisely position, positioned uh, cylinder. And the tolerance, I mean, it's easy to get instruments jammed in there, actually. The tolerances are very, very tight to aid uh, with the precision. Each instrument has its own little fiducial array. That's what this purple thing is here. Uh, and that interacts with the praying mantis thing, not shown on this cut. It interacts with the fiducial array on the robotic arm itself. And ultimately, that's how we're able to determine where exactly to position each screw. Well, that's what I had uh, for the initial discussion. So again, at Holland Hospital, we're continuing to evolve a rehab-first model. 
but we're able to provide for patients uh, the full complement of physicians who are necessary to help with spine care. Um, I just wanted to give us some visuals and topics for discussion, and uh, I'm also happy to answer any questions that anyone may have.